Good morning, church family. I stand before you again today in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I have just a simple message to share with you this morning before we uh, partake of our communion service. Uh, but it's one that we need to be reminded of from time to time, whether we've heard it before or not. And so would you join me in prayer as we open God's word together? Father in heaven, we pray that as we open your word, that we would find you, we would hear your voice speaking to us through this message that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, what is it that makes a person valuable? Have you ever thought about that? You know, we assign value to all kinds of things. Land has more or less value depending on where it is located, whether it has water on the premises, whether it's suitable for development, how many people are looking for land in that area. We value cars based on other things like their features, their age, their mileage, how well they've been maintained. Everything has some value, doesn't it? But what is it that gives a person value? What is it that gives you value? I don't just mean, of course, what is your net worth? What is the sum total of your assets minus your liabilities? I mean, what makes you valuable as a person, worthy of uh, being known and being loved? Is it how successful you are in your career? Is it your grades in school? Is it how physically attractive you are or how nice you are or how many friends you have on Facebook or how many likes your posts get? Is it how popular you are or how influential your family is? Are these the human equivalents of a new home's granite countertops or waterfront location? Are they the features that add or subtract value, like a new car's brand or its engine size or its towing capacity? You probably don't think about them in quite that way. But all the same, you may have felt more valuable or less valuable because of those things. Our world is constantly telling us that our valuable value is intangibly affected by these kinds of features. Magazines, TV shows, social media, all of these things constantly reinforce the message to women that physical attractiveness makes them more valuable. The same sources tell men that a successful career and a substantial income increase their value as human beings. And we ourselves spread those same messages among ourselves as well. Gossip, criticism, judgmental attitudes communicate to other people how we value them and others. Sometimes even our compliments can signal to others that they have value because they performed so well or because they worked so hard or because they look so pretty. The truth is that these value judgments are impossible to escape in the world today. At different times in my own life, I have been unconsciously tempted with the thought that my worth was attached somehow to how well I performed in school or to how I compared to my peers athletically or to how masculine I was. I have felt at times worthless when I failed at something that I tried to accomplish, or when I was rejected by romantic interests, or when I lost a job, or when I fell into sin. I could become worth more. I could become more valuable according to the world by working harder, by accomplishing more, perhaps by being a better Christian. Maybe you could be worth more too, if only you were a better parent. If only you got a promotion, if only you didn't keep messing up dinner, or if you were a better housekeeper, or if your business were more successful, or if you worked out more, or whitened your teeth, or obeyed your parents better, or were a little bit taller, 
You could be worth more to God if you had a better devotional life or if you could just quit doing that one thing that you keep doing. Or if you did more work for the church or if you shared your faith more or whatever. Are these the things that give you value? If they are, then your value is dependent not only on the luck of your genetic makeup and the success of your hard work, but also on the societal and social expectations of the people and the world around you. But church, listen to this. What God says about your, work, your worth is in fact completely different. God says in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. An everlasting love, it says. God loves you with an everlasting love, not one that grows when you are doing everything well, not a love that fades out when you have made mistakes. He values you differently from that. He loves you with an everlasting love. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You know, when Jesus spoke these words to his followers, sparrows were so common that they were practically worthless. Vendors would sell two sparrows for a single Greek coin called an Assyrian. It was one-sixteenth of a denarius, which was a day's wage. The world valued sparrows very little. And yet Jesus says that God sees all of them. They're not insignificant to him. And then, by comparison... You are of so much more value to God. You are so valuable. He is monitoring even the most minute detail of your existence. But why does God value you? What is it about you that makes you valuable to him? That's the question that Job wondered. We see in Job 7 verse 17, he asks this very question. What is man that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? Why would God give you and I his attention? Why would he pause to show interest in us down here on earth? Why would he set his heart on us? Notice what Deuteronomy 7 says. It says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. God loved the Israelites, as Moses is reminding them here in the book of Deuteronomy, not because of the things that the world values. The Israelites, as a nation, had been subjected to the Egyptians. They were slaves. According to the world, among the list of nations that existed at the time, the Israelites were virtually non-existent. They were weak and powerless. They were simply a collection of slaves. They had no standing among the other nations. They were just the property of the Pharaoh. It was not for any of their own qualities that God set his love on them and chose them as his people. And it is not for any of your own qualities that God sets his love on you or chooses you. In fact, God knew you and loved you before you had any qualities at all. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Whoop, I skipped it. I don't have it in the list. Okay, well, I'll just read it to you. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He loved you before you had anything at all. God valued you before you ever became popular. He valued you before you had a successful career, before you finished school or got married. God valued you before you failed. He thought you were worth it before you messed your life up, and he thought you were worth it before you turned your life around. 
God values you and me irrespective of and completely independent from all of these external or performance-based attributes that the world values so highly. He doesn't love us more because of any of these things, and gaining them won't cause him to love us any more than he already does. God loves you because he made you, and that's it. How pretty you are won't change the fact that he created you. The family that you belong to won't change that fact. Neither will the grades that you get or the money that you make or how much time you spend in prayer or in studying the Bible. None of that can change the one thing that makes you valuable to God. He made you, therefore he loves you. And he loves you and values you so much that when you were lost to him, he was willing to pay a great price to get you back. There's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You were bought with a price. He's paid something for you. Whether it's cars or houses or iPhones or Legos, a thing has only as much value as what someone is willing to pay for that thing. And God has paid something for you. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice what he's saying here. What is the right time? When was it that Christ died for the ungodly? When was the right time, he says, while we were still weak? That was the right time. He says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good one, one might dare to die. He says then in verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. You see, in order to gain the chance to get you back, by no means a guaranteed proposition, but simply to get the chance to have you united to him again, God sent his son, the third person of the Godhead, to take on human nature and then to die. Not when you had everything together. Not when you were perfect or close to it. Not when you were pious and full of faith and love toward him. Rather, he did it when you were at your worst. When you were weak. When you were living in sin. When you were still a mess. Think about it. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the lowest point in your life. Maybe you've already been at rock bottom in your life. Maybe... That point is still to come for you. But to God, it doesn't matter. He already knows it. And it is at just that point for you that the three persons of the Godhead are in agreement together. Okay, it's still worth a shot. Let's do it. You at your lowest point, and God pays the highest price that he could. What more is there to say about our value? What more evidence do our broken souls need about what God thinks of us? It's time for us to know, friends, deep down in the depths of our existence that we have worth inherently. Because God himself, God the most glorious and powerful being in the universe the creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign Lord over everything that exists, the only one whose opinion truly is worth anything, that very God is willing to pay anything for you. Regardless of what you or anyone else in the world says, he values you. He loves you. And so friends, let that love for you be the starting point for everything that you do in your life. Let it be your ultimate and most basic motivation in life. God loves me, and so I'm going to do my best. God loves me, and so I'm going to give life everything that I've got. God loves me, so I'm going to use the opportunities that I have to help others. God loves me, and so I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time in his presence. God loves me. So that's why I'm going to listen to him 
Listen to what he says and do it. Let God's love be your initial cause. Start with that at the beginning. God's love is not based on the results of what you do. God's love is based on the fact that he created you and you cannot change that. Nothing can separate you from his love, not heights nor depths, not your parents' words, not your self-sacrificing labor, not your successes nor your failures, not Satan's temptations or accusations, not even your own foolish beliefs. And so accept the truth that he loves you. And let that be your inspiration rather than the goal that you try desperately to achieve. Part of internalizing that truth may include acknowledging what the world wants you to believe about your worth. What are the things that the world has been saying to you about where your worth comes from? If you're unaware of what the world's message is, you may accept it unknowingly, that this is how my worth is. This is where my value comes from. What false ideas about your worth tempt you? What lies have led you to despair, feeling hopeless that anything you do could make you worthy of being loved? What falsehoods have been behind your efforts to become worthy of love and acceptance? Be aware of those messages. Be on the lookout in your thoughts Acknowledge that these messages exist and then remind yourself that your worth does not come from those things. Remember that Christ died for you and he wouldn't pay a penny for a worthless person. And he certainly wouldn't die for them. But he died for you and therefore you must not be worthless. Counter the world's thinking with God's thinking. Choose day by day to label these other messages for what they really are and to accept instead what God says. Church, today we're going to act out in a symbolic form our acceptance of God's truth. This bread and juice that are on the table beside me here symbolize Christ's body and Christ's blood. The sacrifice of himself, which he made to save us. In a few minutes, we're going to partake of this together, and by our eating and our drinking, we are accepting that sacrifice. By the simple act of putting the food and the drink in our mouths and swallowing it, we are making a statement. We are saying to him, to ourselves, to everyone else, that we accept his sacrifice for us, that we choose to believe that he loves us as much as he says he does. And so we share this ritual together. We don't perform it as individuals privately in our own homes. We do it together. It unites us. And so it reminds us to love each other. Because Christ died for all of us. All the other people that are here in this room whom you may value highly or little are loved by God because he created them. And this ritual also reminds us that there are others here who love us. It reminds us that we are not alone on this earth. Christ didn't leave us to fend for ourselves. He put us together, and so we accept him together. And so at this time, we're going to dismiss for our foot washing service. We're going to return here when we're done to share the Lord's Supper together. Now, for anyone who's unfamiliar with our foot washing service, let me explain it briefly. We have a few rooms that have been prepared by the deacons already, one for men, one for women, another for families if you want to do it together. Um, You'll find there towels and basins of water, and you can go there and find a partner and take turns washing each other's feet. And we do this because at the Last Supper, Jesus told us, I have given you an example after he had washed his disciples' feet. He said in John 13, verse 14, If I then... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. And so this service is open to any believer. We, uh, we welcome you to join us. Uh, but if anyone prefers, you're welcome uh, also to stay here in the sanctuary. And when we're done with the foot washing, we're going to return here to share the Lord's 
supper together. So I will dismiss you at this time.